everyone. It is good to see you guys here this morning on this July 12th Communion Sunday of 2020. Welcome, Facebook world. Hopefully things are going for you, going well for you out there in your life. Certainly, um, if you live close by and you want to come join us, we start at 10. Drive on down. We'd love to have you. Uh, we are going to uh, finish our study this morning on the last day prophecy according to Jesus when answering the question of the disciples, what are the signs of the times? Uh, next week, we're going to shift to the Pauline epistles regarding the last day and what he had uh, taught in the, the epistles that he wrote. Uh, then we'll move to Peter and then lastly, John. Maybe a little bit of James in there too. Oh my word. Security. Ted, could you please remove the one wearing that Steeler shirt? For those watching in the Facebook world, someone's coming in disturbing the peace. Um, wearing this Pittsburgh Steeler stuff up in church. But um, praise the Lord. It's good to see my sister and her husband. Praise the Lord. No, no converting other than to Christ. We don't convert to Stealers, haven't you heard, Frank? Thou shalt not steal, you know, and uh, as a ten, one of the Ten Commandments. So, uh, we are going to finish. We're going to finish the uh, teaching of Christ, answering the question, "What are the signs of the times?" So, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we will start in Matthew twenty-five, uh, verse thirty-one. Uh, Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity to study your Word. We thank you, Lord, for the awesome God that you are. We pray for anyone traveling here. Give them traveling mercies. We pray that your word will speak boldly to us, Lord. And we pray that lives will be changed and souls will be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we have, we have tackled some pretty tough conversation, or had some pretty tough conversation in what Jesus had to say in Matthew 24 and 25. And so before the plot thickens for his betrayal and arrest, and Roman crucifixion that he would endure uh, for us, um, Jesus is going to tackle one more topic, which is entitled, The Son of Man Will Judge All People. And of course, Christ defined himself as the Son of Man in Matthew's account of the Gospel. And we're going to look at this, and it, this should challenge each of us as a believer in the things that we do, and it should represent Christ. Okay, and we're also going to talk about the part of Scripture in its full context of why and when Jesus separates the sheep from the goats. Okay, and the goal certainly is that we not be a goat. We do not want to play on that team. We want to be sheep. Okay, and so the Lord's going to explain how we truly know if we're a sheep or not. Okay, and there's only two teams. Either you play with the sheep or you play with the goats. There's not an in-between team, all right? And so there's two animals, if you will, and it's important that we understand we want to be on the right side, which are the sheep. Okay, so here we go. We're going to break this down. Matthew 25, starting in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory... And all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Now, Jesus jumps ahead now again to his second coming. All right. T jumps ahead to the judgment seat of Christ, the great white throne judgment, where the Lord is taking the focus, not just as the son of man, the Messiah. Now he's switching his title to judge. If you've ever watched the Andy Griffith show, on his desk in his office there in the sheriff's department, it says sheriff, okay? But back in the day, the sheriff would also be the justice of the peace. So if someone was coming in to get married or someone was coming in to go to court, he would flip his sign around from sheriff to justice of the peace. If you've seen those episodes and the, and the, the defendant wants to see the judge, and, and Andy says, okay, Sheriff Taylor says, okay, and he flips his sign around and says, justice of the peace, now you're talking to the judge. Well, Jesus is doing the same thing here. He's shifting his focus from teacher and savior to judge. 
okay, the Ancient of Days prophecy where all authority has been given uh, to Jesus, the Son of Man, from the Ancient of Days or from the Father, okay, and so he plays the role of judge in this last part. Some people will say, well, Jesus never talked about his, his role as judge. You haven't read the gospel when someone tells me that. He talked about it a lot, okay, and he's talking about it now before the plot thickens for his capture, if you will, all right? And so Jesus clearly talked about his role as judge and who he was going to uh, be at the judgment seat. Yes, question, Marcia. Okay, well, I'm glad you're here today, Marcia, so I can explain it through through the teaching of his word. Okay, so when the Son of Man comes, ladies, we're in Matthew 25, uh, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Again, remember we studied, uh, I remember teaching it out back on the gazebo, if you watched it live on Facebook. This is when we, before we could meet. But I, I spoke about the Ancient of Days prophecy. That's what Jesus is confirming here. He is the Son of Man. All glory is being given to him. All authority has been given to him at the will of the Father. Okay, And he sits on his throne to judge. He does not sit on his throne to declare kumbaya and everybody feel good. Okay, When you go into a courtroom and the bailiff says, all rise, what does that mean? Everybody stand up, but what does that mean? When, you, when he says, all rise, what's happening? The judge is coming into the room. Okay, the judge is coming into the room, and you best rise. And then the judge will say, wait to be seated. And when, he, when you sit, then court is now in session. Okay, well, when Jesus is sitting on his throne, court is now in session, and he is the judge. So I want to make sure everybody's following along here in what we're talking about. Because each and every one of us are going before the Lord to give an account of our lives. And remember, there's two teams you're going to be sent to. The sheep or the goats. All right, this is the last thing Jesus teaches on before it goes into his plot and his arrest and his betrayal and all that betrayal and arrest by Judas. Yes. Yes. You're either going to be a sheep or you're going to be a goat. And some of those goats were thought they were sheep. They thought they were, remember Jesus said, you'll, do, you'll, you'll teach in my name, heal in my name, depart from me for I never knew you. Okay. And so obviously the sheep know the voice of their shepherd. But there's going to be a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing. Okay. And these wolves will become goats. Okay. If you will. Jesus is very clear. There's nobody fooling Jesus. You can fool me, anybody can put on the dog, but you cannot fool Jesus. He knows, who's, he knows who his sheep are, and he knows who his goats are. Yes, Ted. Believers that are deceived are people who were never believers in the first place. Uh, that were um, wolves. That were, or, you know, obviously James tells us faith of that works is dead. Jesus tells us lukewarm church he wants no part of, our lukewarm believer. Okay, absolutely, which we're going to talk about later in the service um, uh, when we look at Paul's teaching. Yes, no. Yes. Yes, because you're condemned already. If you choose not to believe, you're, you're born into sin. You're born needing the Savior. Every one of us, you know, so verse 32 and all nations will be gathered together before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. The good shepherd, all judgment, all authority has been given to him by the father of the ancient of days, as we've already talked about two months ago, as well as this morning. OK, Jesus is that shepherd who is dividing Okay, he's dividing reality uh, from some fantasy world. He's, he's dividing his sheep and the goats, similar to when he gave the parable of the wheat and the tares. Sometimes 
the, the, obviously all the time the wheat and the tares go together, and it's not until the harvest that you know which is which. Well, at judgment, let me just say this, guys. I'll put it as nice as I can. After judgment takes place, when we're in heaven, we're going to look around and say, wow, you're here? And somebody may look at you and say, wow, you're here? And then you may look for somebody and they not be here because they were a goat. Okay? So it's really important that we know Jesus knows what he's talking about. Follow the text. Yes. Yes, even even Lucifer, uh, we find in Scripture during the tribulation, Satan himself, Lucifer, the worship leader, is going to try to get back into heaven. And Jesus is going to send Michael to usher him out and then throw him to the earth. And that's how that's how Satan gets back to the earth in the flesh, if you will, is because uh, he gets thrown out by Michael. But he tries to sneak back into heaven. Uh, Revelation 11 tells us. Yes, Ted. If we're a true sheep, we certainly do. Absolutely, we certainly do, and and if if we get, which is why, remember, how many times, who remembers from Matthew 24, how many times did Jesus warn us not to be deceived? What's the number of completion? Seven. Seven times he warned us. He, he first said, make sure your heart's not troubled, it's on you to take responsibility, but he warned us seven times in Matthew 24 not to be deceived. Okay, because deception is going to be coming from everywhere. Okay, so make sure what I'm teaching, add it up to the word. You know, uh, take ownership of that. Yes, ma'am. His word. Because his word, that's why, why knowing and studying his word is so important. How do we, how does someone at the Department of Treasury know when something is counterfeit? They don't study all the counterfeit bills out there. They study the authentic. What we do, Marcia, as believers is we study the authentic. We study the word. Jesus is the word, according to John 1. Well, that's what you should always do. Because God's not the author of confusion. The adversary does everything in the gray arena. God is black and white. Okay, it's clear. It's his word. All right? So, here is, so Jesus tells us he is going to separate one from another, just as the shepherd separates the wheat from the goat. I'm sorry, the sheep from the goats. All right. And so verse 33. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Now, the guys, this is just a prophetic term. Um, you know, I'm left handed when it comes to batting um, and doing a lot of things left handed. My sister's left handed. A lot of you are left handed. That does not mean you're demonic. OK, or that you're a goat. This is a prophetic term. And I think when we look at the right hand, we can think of righteousness the left hand, we think of unrighteous. That does not mean, I know there are some Christians, and certainly the Catholic faith, uh, for many years believed that that left hand was demonic. Uh, that's not it. The, Jesus just uses this illustration to separate righteous from unrighteous, and it's, it's more of a figurative type of, um, uh, type of passage. Okay, So if you're left-handed here, do not think you're going to hell. Okay, uh, and, and I know a lot of people teach that. Yes. 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 Well, that's political, political ideology there uh, as well. But then you have to remember, too, there are several places in Scripture where God used the righteousness of a left-handed man to speak on his behalf or to be heard on his behalf or do something on his behalf, like kill the enemy because he was left-handed. So his, he, yep, his sword was on the left side, and God used the righteousness of a left-handed man. So, uh, so if you're left-handed here, do not worry. You can still be a sheep if you call upon the name of the Lord and live for him. Okay, uh, so here we go. Verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Okay, and so here it is. Here is Jesus speaking. His father, this has been inherited. This has been the plan. You can now, those on the right or the sheep, can now enter 
heaven, okay, can now enter. Uh, and as Paul has said, Jesus Christ is the gatekeeper according to John 10. All right? And so the, um, you can inherit what's been prepare, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Remember, God is all-knowing. Okay? Again, no one's sneaking in. Those that come in are those that the Father has revealed His Son, and you, by your free will decision, have called on the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? And you are carrying that out. God uh, has had a sovereign plan uh, from the beginning. But then Jesus explains, notice at the end of verse 34, there is a colon, which means to be continued. There's going to be some facts following that colon that you have to understand in order to be that sheep. If you don't understand these things, you could easily go the road of a goat or a lukewarm Christian or a wolf in sheep's clothing and not even know it until judgment. If you don't know the scripture or you're not taught the scripture or haven't studied the scripture. Okay, verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Now, Jesus gives some ministry uh, callings here for us. And notice Jesus puts himself in the same category of the orphan, the prisoner, uh, the hungry person, the naked person. Jesus puts himself in that same category, which is going to give a little confusion, at least at first, to the sheep. Verse 37. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty, or give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Okay, so it's like, well, Lord, you were never in those places. You were never in those places. Remember, this is before Jesus has, is arrested. Okay, this is his last teaching before he's arrested. Okay, so, there, so here the Lord is speaking of the response that the sheep are going to give. All right? And so ask yourself, even before we look at Jesus' response to the righteous, the sheep, okay, ask yourself this question. How often do you find yourself feeling compassionate or ministering to someone who is hungry or thirsty, to a stranger, okay, all right, someone who is naked, someone who is sick, or someone who is incarcerated? Hey, Art, God bless you, brother. Think about that. These, the reason I ask this question, are these are mandates that the apostles are going to bring up Paul and Peter, Timothy, James, and John are going to bring up these mandates later for Christians to be carried out. Yes, Patrice. Yeah, certainly. A prison could be the prison of one's mind. It can be a prison of one's, you committed a crime and you have to serve your time. Uh, it can be a debtor's prison. Some countries in the world still have debtor's prison. Uh, some people, especially in the continent of Africa, forego their children to pay for their debt. Uh, and so uh, prison can be uh, physical. It can be psychological. It can be spiritual. Addiction, certainly. Yeah, certainly, uh, you know, uh, definitely so. Um, and But wherever that person is, in the prison of their soul, the prison of their spirit, the prison physically, wherever they are, the bottom line is, Jesus is there too. Okay? We have a mandate. We have a mandate as his sheep, which we're going to look at Jesus' response here in just a second. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah, King David writing, the deepest sea, highest mountain, and Sheol itself. And your presence is there with Where can I go to flee from the presence of the Lord, David writes. Okay. Look at Jesus' response. Verse 40. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly I say to you, 
inasmuch as you did one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Brethren is referring to believers, the church, his children. Okay? Even one of these, and even a person that's the least situation, the least wrongdoing, the, the least problematic, not just the most, the most severe case, but just even a small case, you did it for the Lord. Okay? So important here in Jesus' last lesson. His last lesson. He's explaining what he's looking for from his sheep. Okay? He's not looking for anybody to play church. All right? And I'll be honest with you. I shared Tuesday night at our workshop. I'm praying that God will raise up someone to help me with visit, visiting the sick as a visitation ministry. Praying that God would help with visiting uh uh, shut-ins and, and homebound and folks that start coming to the church and ask for a visit or uh, someone who is um, who is not well, okay? We have a biblical mandate to do that, okay? Jesus has said, said verse 40 is such a, a powerful verse to me because it defines what I do. Define what I did as a Christian when I first got saved, as a deacon, as an, as a pastor for 17 years. Oh, okay, I thought you had a question there, brother. And the king will answer and say to them, I surely I say to you, inasmuch as you do it, did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Okay? And so this is extremely important. God is so compassionate. He's so caring. You know, just like with visiting, um, you know, here soon, uh, the man who's, who's charged with vehicular manslaughter and intoxication and all that stuff, you know, the bicyclist that died, Jesus went to the cross for that man. We can't shun him. We can't turn our back from him. Uh, Jesus, you know, you did it to me. Uh, and so the sheep will be men and women of great action. And a lot of these things you think, well, the government, that's what they're supposed to do. Actually, the government's doing it because the church failed. Let's call it what it is. These are mandates of Jesus long before the American Constitution was ever written. Yes, Paul. Sure. And move on. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, obviously, yeah, and that's a, that, they're absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's kind of why I follow the motto, as long as someone wants me around, I'll continue to go. And then when I discern that they don't want me around or they tell me they don't want me around, then as you said, we have to dust off our feet and move on. And it's very difficult to do to love somebody in a deep pit when they are either lost or out of control or uh, practicing evil, uh, their flesh is winning out, but to still go because they still crave your uh, presence or crave your teaching or obviously trying to share Christ. Um, Well, then that's where you have to use wisdom and say, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not coming here to pay a bill. I'm not coming here to give you cash. I never give cash. Uh, you know, we have to use wisdom in what we learn, okay? But we cannot uh, turn away a person because most of, the, most of these situations, okay, hungry, thirsty, naked, sick, prison, most of those things are usually caused because of someone's own poor choice, or oppression in the nation that they live in. Yes, Montana. Ted, yes. Yes. Oh, certainly.
Yes. Well, sir, absolutely. And that's, and that's the voice that as sheep, we can listen to the shepherd's voice for specific instruction when we're trying to help someone in need. Now, someone, just like when Jesus gave the parable of the Good Samaritan, those were religious folks, supposed to be godly folks, that walk by this man who's dying in the street. Okay? And so, you know, Jesus said, who made the right choice and who, you know, who's the eternal reward here? Oh, it's the Good Samaritan. Okay? And so, but we often do that many times. Okay? Or we just are simply apathetic to what's going on around us. Or we make a judgment, well, that person doesn't deserve help. That person doesn't deserve. Well, Jesus is saying that's not an option for a sheep. As a sheep, we have to be understanding that even when we do the least of these things, we're doing it for the Lord. Okay, so important. That's a sheep. This, remember, this is his last teaching. This isn't, in my opinion, it's not optional for, let, hey, pastor, I'm going to go think about this. This is a mandate of scripture. And if Jesus is going, when he's separating the sheep from the goat, he's not just looking for somebody that gave a little cheap grace or bought a little fire insurance. He's looking for somebody who put their life in Christ, somebody who's carrying out the action that glorifies his father, somebody who's willing to go to the darkest places with someone, okay, and, and somebody who's even when, and I've done this, guys, I've done this many times in 17 years, you're in the block with somebody, they're wearing orange or blue or gray, whatever the color is, and they know they made a mistake, and you go in there and you tell Jesus loves you. And we can repent of that right now, and God can do a miracle. God can do something amazing. God can do something wonderful. And I tell you what, sheep are going to take some heat because other sheep bite and other sheep who very well could be goat underneath. They get upset when they see another believer or a pastor, whoever it is that's a sheep going into these dark places. Why do I go into those places? Because Jesus told us to. Matter of fact, it's the last thing he said before the plot thickened for his betrayal and arrest and trial. Yeah, well, to go and make disciples, yeah. Trees? Yes. Absolutely. No doubt. And we, wanna, we want to finish strong. But again, assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. All right? And so it's, notice here, there's nothing about writing a check. Some people will say, well, I'll just write a check and that'll solve it. I'll put it in Compassion Ministry. No, there's nothing here about writing a check. This here is about being the hands and feet of Jesus. This here is being radical for the Lord. This here is boots on the ground. Sheep. Okay, sheep. That's who the sheep are. Now let's shift and find out who the goats are. Verse 41, then he, Jesus, will also say to those on the left hand, remember the left hand are the goats, depart from me. That's what he said to the wolves in sheep clothing, depart from me for I never knew you. Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I want no part of a goat. Jesus' opening line when explaining who the goats are is, depart from me. Move on. You are not, nothing to do with me. All right? And so uh, there's no place for righteousness, righteousness in here. Calls them cursed. The bottom line is either you're blessed or you're cursed. That's the bottom line. Okay, blessed is a sheep, cursed is a goat. Why would anyone want to be a goat? Bonhoeffer in his book, 
the cost of discipleship. He explains this parable. He, basically, it's, a, it's teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, but he jumps to Jesus' teaching in Matthew 24 and 25 and parts of it as well. And he explains in this book why uh, tre- cheap grace or fire insurance, there's no room for that in the family of God whatsoever based on what we're learning today. Yes. I think the goats are wolves in sheep's clothing. Oh, yeah, let's talk about unbelievers as well, because they're all the same. They're all born into condemnation. They've never received the blessing of God. The same reward is going to be given to a false teacher who pastors a church, which is eternity in hell if they have it, which is what uh, the founder of the Methodist church, John Wesley, was afraid of when he finally converted to Christ at 84 years old, uh, was because he had never he had never became a sheep himself. Yes, absolutely. Which is why the Great Commission is so important, which is why being authentic is so important. Dead. Yes. Yes. He did. And everything he did, he's asked us to do. Even die. Yes, Julia. Yes. You have nothing. Paul said, without nothing, you're lost. Without love, you're lost. Yeah, they're still a ghost. And that's what you, Jesus said in Matthew 7. Some will heal in my name, cast out demons in my name, teach in my name, depart from me, for I never knew. Correct. And yeah, good deeds do not get you to heaven. If that was the case, Jesus wouldn't have needed to die. We would have just taught works. Works is just the reward of who we believe in. Faith without works is dead. Works is just because Jesus asked to us to perform works in Matthew 5 uh, to the glory of his Father. Um, works is just simply because we're supposed to be set apart. And the sheep, are, that's what this is all about. The sheep are supposed to be set apart from the world. There's supposed to be something different about us as salt and light. Raising your hand there, Mr. Well, certainly, uh, Frank, we all are sinners. And the only thing that Jesus defines as unpardonable is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So when someone is, is, is passing judgment, even though that violates Scripture... Uh, I believe it can be forgiven at, at the judgment seat. However, if someone is passing judgment and they've really ne- never met the master or they themselves are just becoming a holier-than-thou type of individual, because truly, if we've come to the foot of the cross and we truly are walking with Christ, we're going to remember these things in Scripture. We're gonna, God's Word's going to change us because, remember, our body now is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's going to do His job. And if a person is half in and half out, Jesus said, I'm spewing you out. He has no no halfway. The lukewarm church, Revelation 3, it's called the church at Laodicea. Paula, Marcia, and Julia. Correct. Yes. No. Yeah. Yes. Yes. 
He d- and man looks at the outward approach, and yes, God certainly knows our heart, and there's no fool in him. Uh, Marcia? Yeah, well, we got we got to surrender that to the Lord. I would say that's probably a, a thorn in the flesh, and well, yeah, well, that's where that's where we've got to remember what Jesus said: "Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do." And we have to uh, we have to overcome evil with good, and clearly, hatred is evil. So we have to overcome hatred with good. Yeah. Well, I, w- I would s- I would apologize to them and humble yourself and let God work through your faith. Uh, Teresa, then Julia. Is that yes? Ongoing. And ongoing. Oh, it happens to me every day. It happens to me all the time. Where I thought I had something, the Lord shows up to me, and oh, I got to go out to the woodshed. Yeah, yes, it's ongoing. No doubt. Uh, except for Jesus. He was perfect, even though CNN and Mr. Lemon said this week that Jesus was not perfect. Oh, yeah, it's crazy stuff. Yeah, on CNN made a big, you guys, I posted on Facebook, too, made a huge thing that Jesus admittedly was not perfect. That's what, that's what he, Lineman, yes, him. But he didn't, he didn't cite that. He just said admittedly and set the whole, yeah, way out in left field. I commented on Facebook. Yes, Julia. No halfway. Correct. Yes. Correct. Correct. Uh, me personally, uh, I do not believe it's impo- it, I think it's impossible for a person to say that they believe in Christ, but his word is not true. I, correct. Correct. I ignore that. Yes. Correct. And Jesus tells us that we're going to be judged according to his word. Yes, until the very end, he put James back in the Bible. 65 books of the Lutheran Bible until the very end. So, yes, you are, um, I believe fully that, that we can't do that. Uh, we cannot play the role of God. You either believe God's word is the inspired word of God and all scripture is, or it's not. Um, because if not, you're going to have so many loose ends in your faith. Uh, you eventually, you're going to call someone to stumble. You're going to stumble yourself. And you're going to be confused. Who's the father of confusion? The adversary, not God. Okay? All right. Verse 42. Again, the end of verse 41 ends in a colon. So there's a to be continued pieces here. Jesus is speaking about the goats this time. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Oh, this guy, don't, don't get mad at me. This is Jesus. This is Jesus speaking of the goats. Okay, this is, notice the same ex- expectation is the same for all humankind and for all believers. Okay? He used the sheep and the goats. He was looking for the same thing. But he got a different result. The goats, okay, did not give Jesus food or drink or take him in, clothes or visitation. That defines a goat. Yes. Johnny Cash. I fell in the burning wind. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Go to the grocery store. You can buy ten times more at the grocery store than you can going out to eat.
Yeah. No, no. You when you give, you have to use wisdom, brother. Um, no, no doubt. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. We have to use guys. This is why prayer is so important, because you never know who you're going to meet, what situation is going to come in. Um, but you can you can. T- it's it's kind of like with Governor LePage when he revamped food stamps. You know, he said we're not going to do food stamps for uh, for going out and getting sandwiches and Italians and all these different things. I think Mills brought him back in now. But I, but LePage said we're not going to let people use food stamps and go to a convenience store and you could and buy three sandwiches, but you could have went to Walmart and bought 10 pounds of meat yourself and made enough sandwiches for three weeks rather than pay five times the price getting an Italian at Circle K. And his whole argument was it was to use wisdom when helping people in need rather than enabling behavior. Yes. 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 Uh, and if you take some heat for it, then you have to be willing to take some heat. And if that person's really in need, they're going to be grateful. They're going to be grateful. And if, the, and if that gratefulness is not present, then you know you've got a joker. Uh, yeah, I knew, I, knew, I knew Mills changed everything when she came in. She changed everything. But, guys, we've got we to move on because I'm almost out of time. All right? So verse, verse, here is the goat's response to Jesus' statement. Verse 44, okay? Then they will, uh, I'm sorry, they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or strange or a stranger or naked or sick in prison and did not minister to you? Okay, so they ask the same type of question here. All right, when did we see Jesus? If you had been sick, we would have certainly come to see you. If, if you had been naked, we certainly would have clothed you, okay? And obviously, Jesus is about to be captured here in just a day. Uh, right after he finishes teaching, that's going to be put to the test and fail, um, okay? And so uh, his response, verse 45, Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, as much, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. What a statement. What a statement. Okay? What a statement by our Lord and the things that he did not see taking place from the goats. Notice here, he did not call the goats brethren like he did the sheep. Really important. Notice he did not declare that the goats were part of his church. So there are a few things missing. Comparing the sheep and the goats. And one of those is the word brethren. Is absent from the goats. Lastly, verse 26. I'm sorry, 46. And this is a tough verse, guys. I've taught this, la- I've taught this passage. I've taught this uh, seven times. This la- I've taught the prophecy five times, but this is the seventh time looking at my notes because I keep it all so I know when I've done things. But seven times teaching this passage or preaching this passage. And 46 has been gut-wrenching since the first time I taught it. And it's even more painful today because I believe Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. And it could very well be today. He's coming back for his sheep. Okay? He's coming back for the faithful. Remember that. And verse 46, And these, referring to the goats, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous, the sheep, into eternal life. And Jesus is the one 
who saves us, and he's also the one who judges us. And the verdict is clear. As Paul writes in Scripture, we reap what we sow. There is no, you know, fooling around and, and sneaking in. There is no, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just live how I want today, and then and when I get older, I'll, I'll wind down. There is no, don't boast in tomorrow. It may not come. This side of the rapture or this side of your death, that'd be a terrible mistake. We, we see here the verdict. And guys, I just want to be frank with you, because Scripture tells us in the epistles of Paul, as well as John the Revelator in the book of Revelation, God, do not pray God to change his mind. Notice Scripture, and I just taught on this two weeks ago. Mercy comes before judgment. The mercy time is now. What Jesus is talking about with the sheep and the goats as the judge, that's judgment time. There's no room for mercy at judgment. Jesus has to render a verdict based on his word. If mercy was going to be present at judgment outside of the blood of Christ, then why do we need the cross? Good to see you young people today. God bless you. Why would we need the cross? If mercy is going to be present at judgment outside of the blood. The mercy the sheep are going to receive is because of the blood of Christ through faith in which they called on his name. There is no room for mercy for the goat. Do you see any mercy in there and you will go into everlasting punishment? Or the five times that we've studied here in Matthew 24 and 25, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. For evil servants, unbelievers, and now the goats? I don't see any mercy in that. Yes. Oh, no. Yes. Correct. Everyone will have a chance at the mercy of the Lord through faith. Okay. So, uh, I believe, person, I believe God will not hold someone accountable if they never hear the good news. Which is why missions, which is why we do here, we have a missions budget now of $800 a month. Abroad missions, compassion ministry, local missions, uh, we spend thousands a month, okay? Because we want to carry out what Jesus said the sheep should be doing so that people can hear. Uh, Paul. Yes, what? Well. Yes, yeah, certainly the uh, God. Well, even before Jesus can return at the end of the tribulation, everyone has to hear. He can't return until everyone hears. He's going to send the two the two witnesses and then obviously angels. Oh yeah, God reveals His Son. We hear testimonies from missionaries all the time where, um, you know, oak trees. God used an oak tree tree to define. David Fair is talking about in Chad a big tall tree there that God, you know, uh, they thought from a distance it was giants coming and they turned over to the God of Jesus. And as they got closer, they realized they were dealing with white trees. Um, I forget the type of tree it was, but David Ferris shared about that in chat. Uh, so, yes, certainly God will reveal, um, but we have a job to make sure that we're available to be that voice so people can hear. Um, and including in the River Valley, there are people here in the River Valley that have never heard who Jesus is. They only know him as a swear name. They don't know who he is. We're not living in the 1960s when people went to school and they learned about Jesus and they had prayer in school and Bible reading in school. Those days are gone. We are living in a time where people right here have never heard who Jesus really is. All right? So, that brings an end to Jesus' teaching on answering the question, what are the signs of the times? Uh, next week, we're going to jump to Paul's letter to the Thessalonian church. Okay? 
and the signs of the times, and we'll look at the Corinthian church as well, where in the twinkle of an eye, uh, so we want to be ready, um, and what uh, God's servants, uh, Paul, Peter, James, um, John, and Jude, the five that we're going to study, a little bit of Jude, uh, we'll start that next week. Okay, so we'll close in prayer, take a 10-minute reprieve, and um, if you did not uh, sign in when you came, uh, Andy's out there with the sign-in sheet uh, so we can log everybody that's here. Father God, we just thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that you will, uh, we know your word never returns void, and we pray that we will all be sheep here, Lord, may there be no goats, both here as well as those watching on Facebook, may we be sheep. Uh, Bless us today, Lord, as we worship you in spirit and in truth. And again, I pray may lives be changed and souls saved. In Jesus' name, amen.